Okay, today we're talking, the sports focus is going to be on baseball and softball, which I love because um, baseball and softball games are just really a lot of fun to work, a lot of fun to keep stats for, a lot of, a lot of fun to write about. And then we're going to talk about sports talk radio. Those of you who got to go to Arrowhead the other day, good time? Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Bob's a crusty old beggar, didn't he? <laughs> I was shocked. Shocked may not be the right word. A little surprised at how down he is on Sports Talk Radio. A lot of professional sports outlets don't like Sports Talk because you do get some guys on there just bashing on the team and every armchair quarterback calling in saying what they should or should not be doing to fix the team. I did like and appreciate what he had to say that you know a lot of them don't ever even go to the games. They'll watch on TV, they'll listen on the radio, they'll read it in the paper, and then they'll just make their assessments. I don't know what percentage don't go to the games, but that's one thing that I think I've talked to you guys about, that when we do the debate segment of sports page or whatever that I've heard, one of the complaints is, well, they're students. They don't really have a whole lot of credibility. What do they know about the teams? Well, I hate that. For one thing, and like you know, you're, they probably know more about covering sports and talking sports than, than any of us do because they listen to it, they read it, they're all about it. But I also hate it because just because you're young doesn't mean you don't know anything, all right? But you know you have that perception, and so how do you overcome it? Make sure you go to the games. If you're going to debate, talk about the Mules and Jennies, make sure you go to their games so you can see what's going on, so you can witness it firsthand. Not watching our live stream, not listening on the radio, not reading about it or talking to your friends afterwards. Actually go to the events. And when you get out of here, if that's the route you want to go, if you want to go into sports talk, which as I've gotten more into talking about this and teaching this class, if I had to do it over again, I might think about doing sports talk radio because it sure does look like a lot of fun. Um, but make sure you go to the events. You know, whether, whether it is a ball game or whether they have a, uh, like the Royals Caravan when they go around to different towns go to those types of things. When they did their trophy presentation this year and they took the World Series trophy all around the state, go to some of those events so you know firsthand what it is you're talking about and that instantly is going to jack your credibility up. So, okay. What else did you take from visiting with Bob? Allison, what did you get out of it? Yeah. Someone asked that they can't report it or they lose their credentials. Right. So, I mean, 
OTAs. Yeah, OTAs. Yeah. yeah. But who cares? But they're the figuring time, things out there. <clears throat> but at the same time, like, report it. You know, it looks good. It looks bad. Yeah. Michael? I was going to say something about the bias, but I like how we talk about how um, PR has changed from whenever he was doing it to now. He had social media. A lot of people get their information from like Twitter, and that's how they broadcast stuff out through mm -hmm. Twitter and social media. Yeah. I really liked when he was talking about the evolution of how the reporting has changed because you know, back in the day, it was newspaper. That's all you had. There was no television. Radio was kind of in its infancy. You had the newspaper to really give you the story and tell you what happened. Radio came along and you could listen to it, but you still didn't have a whole lot of depth. And then television came on when they started broadcasting those games, and we'll talk more about this in, uh, when you take intro sports broadcasting. Um, but if I could watch the game on Sunday, why do I need to read about it on Monday? I watched it. I saw what happened. So uh, we have to change the way we report what, what kind of stories we're writing about. Are we just going to do feature stories? Are we going to do profiles? Are we going to do analysis? Um, those types of things. It was also very interesting when he was saying that back in the day, the reporters traveled with the team, and there were certain topics that were off limits. You didn't talk about it. Why has that changed? Do you think that the athletes now are, don't, are more Ornery. They don't behave as much as the athletes back then. I think now with social media, everything goes out. It's easier for someone, even if you're just like seeing the team somewhere, they can tweet out, post something. Like but why? Why tweet that out? I mean, back again, back in the day, were, were the athletes better behaved? Probably not. Maybe even worse. Okay. So why now? Why is why is there? I know then they didn't have the opportunity to do that, but the way Bob was talking, and to some extent early in my career it was still the same way. And I'm not nearly as old as Bob is, but even as early as when I was when I was in your seats and I was working for the Civilian Democrat, you just didn't see those things, whether it was tweeted out or on the evening news or in the paper or not. He is more cutthroat than what he used to be. Competition. There's more outlets, there's more places to get the information, and guys, media, television stations, newspapers, magazines, it's a business. They're there to make money. As much as we would like to think that it's altruistic and um, the reason we have the news media is because in a democracy, you've got to have the news, you need to know who to vote for, you need to know what the topics are. Yes, that's true. For the owners of those companies, it's business. How can I make more money? Okay. How do I make more money? I get more eyes on my my network. I get more readers in my paper. I get more listeners on my radio station. How do I do that? I have to sensationalize some things. I have to get the story nobody else is getting. Everybody's reporting about the game last night. Has anybody reported about Eric Hosmer being drunk and the uh, Power and Light, thank you, I got the light, I can remember the first one. The Power and Light District and how he wrecked the car. Was anybody else reporting on that? No? Okay, well then I need to get on it, and I need to get on it first, and I need to get on it fast. Okay. That's why you've seen so many of those changes. And an old guy like Bob that back, remembers back in the day when you didn't report about those things as a PR person, hallelujah, just report on the game. It makes it tough when you work in public relations. but. But there are also a lot more jobs in PR now, in, uh, with professional teams, with college teams, and things like that. Because, you know, when I worked in it, not that many years ago, 10 years ago, when I worked in it, we did media guides, we did news releases, we made phone calls, we did statistics and games. That was pretty much it. The week that I left was the week that Facebook really started kind of hitting it. And one of our football players, All America Free Safety, had a picture on Facebook of himself in a Mules football t-shirt holding a beer. And that one of our assistant ABs called me and said, what are we going to do about this? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to come up with a policy. Okay. Now, they do a lot more with marketing and PR. 
they also now have their own videographer who does her own highlight packages and she does the, the packages that go on the video board and things like that. So there's lots of different ways that you can use your skills, not just in the news media, but with colleges or professional teams. Okay. So those are some things to think about. Switching gears though, talk about baseball and softball. The thing I love about baseball is all the stats. As an old sports information guy, I'm just a stat geek. And they're changing all the time. It used to be that we were concerned for pitchers with their wins and losses and their ERA, with batters with their batting average and how many home runs they hit. Okay? But you think about, I don't know how many years ago, they started looking at pitchers and it wasn't the one loss record that was as important as their ERA. Why do you think that is? Why would the ERA be more important to coaches and people analyzing than wins and losses when they're evaluating the pitcher? One, you can give up one run but lose the game. You can give up one run and still lose the game. I can throw a no-hitter and lose. You know, my team could commit five errors. I did my job. I put the ball right where it needed to be. I got 20 strikeouts in the game and I lost the game because my defense didn't play well. So we evaluate more on earned run average than we do wins and losses anymore. Um, we also, because of specialization, because you have bullpens like the Royals, if you're a starter, we want six innings out of you. That was never the case. We want nine innings out of you. We want you to go the distance. That's what you're paid the big bucks for. Now we're gonna protect those arms. Well, if you get to the sixth inning and the score's tied, you don't get a decision. Whoever the reliever is that takes your place comes in and gets the decision. That's why with relievers, they come up with a new stat. It used to be saves. That was the big one because if you're the closer and you save the win, good on you. Well, what are we going to do for those relievers in the middle between the starter and the, and the closer? Well, we're going to come up with a hold. Same kind of concept as a save, but we need to get a stat to them so we can evaluate their, their abilities and what they've done. Okay? Um, Earned run average is how many earned runs you give up over nine innings. Not how many runs, because runs is however many runs they score, but they can score a run off of a pass ball or off of an error. That should be credited to the pitcher. He did his job or she did her job. So we just look at the earned run average, okay? Keep in mind that when you're figuring earned run average, you have to think, is this baseball or softball? Baseball plays how many innings? Nine, how many so softball play? Seven. So it's based off of how many innings are in the game, how many innings they could play. Baseball in college really used to be a pain in the butt to figure ERA because in the middle of the week, they played the double headers that were seven innings each. You still had to figure their ERA over nine innings. Well, they, only really got, they, they threw a complete game, but they only threw seven innings. They didn't throw nine. So how do you still have to figure it off in nine innings? Okay. Uh, what's OPS? On base plus slugging. Why is that important? Hmm? Why is it a stupid stat? Why would you put on base plus slugging? What does it demonstrate? Well, let's start, I guess let's start backwards. What's on? What's OBP? On base, on base percentage, which figures what? Walks, and average. Walks, batting average, hit by pitch. How many times you get on base? Okay, it doesn't include uh, fielder's choices. Fielder's choice doesn't include errors. It's how many times you worked your way out of base, either by a hit, by getting walked, or by getting hit by a pitch. Doesn't it also like still on base? You're already on base. It's figuring how often you get on base. Critical stat, okay? Because the more times you're on base, the more chance you have to score. Batting average looks at, your, or your average looks at how many times you get a hit versus how many times you're at bat, right? Well, then we're going to come up with OBP on base percentage because we want to include the walks. So you may be batting 300, but you may have an on base plus or on base percentage of 410. Well, that means you walk a lot. You get on base a lot. That's that's really good. Okay. Slugging percentage is what? Just how many total bases you get. So the higher your slugging percentage, the more extra base hits you get, the more pop you have in your bat. Right. So you look at your big sluggers, your guys that maybe strike out a lot, but they get a lot of extra base hits. That's going to jack your slugging percentage up. So if you take a guy with a high OPS, that's somebody who gets on base and they hit for a lot of power. 
that is a total battle versus the guy that he's a single hitter, but he walks a lot. You know, a Gerard Dyson walks a lot, hits for hits for average. He gets on base, he steals bases. Okay, great. Then you've got the old Kendrys Morales from last year, who has a lot of pop in his bat, a lot of doubles, a lot of home runs. Put those two together, you've got a really good total batter. So they want to come up with a stat to figure out, okay, well, who's a overall batter, not just an on-base guy or not just a slugger. Okay. What's the difference, and this is important for you to note, what's the difference between an AB and a PA? AB is what? At bat, what's PA? Plate appearances. Plate appearances. What's the difference so besides appearances. these two? What's an at bat? That's don't include walks, do at bats do not include walks. Hit by pitch. Sacrifice fly. Sacrifice hit. Okay. What's the difference between a sack fly and a sack hit? You have to score off a sack fly. The only time you can get a sack fly is if a runner's on third base, you hit it deep to the outfield, they catch it, and run on third scores. Runners on second base and advances to third, which the Royals have been doing a lot lately, and now other teams are trying to follow along. That's not a sack fly. Okay. A sack hit is when you see them lay down a bunt, and they're up there to bunt. You see them, you know, they're up here ready to bat. Pitcher goes into his windup, and they come down here and they square up the bunt. They're giving themselves up. That's why it's a sacrifice. You're just trying to advance a runner. Okay. Those don't count because you're aiming to get out. You're just trying. I may not be try. I may be trying to get a hit when I'm swinging away and I get a sack fly, but I don't care if they catch it. Okay, I just want to get the ball deep enough that somebody scores. All right. So we don't want that to go against their abs because that goes against their batting average. All right. The plate appearances, on the other hand, every time you step to the plate, it includes everything. So when you're talking about somebody's plate appearances, just keep in mind there is a difference. This will go against their average because it does include if you hit into an error that's going against your average, you should have been out. If you, um, you know, if you strike out, if you do anything, you can up to the plate. Okay. Range score and WAR wins against replacement. Those are stats that they started coming up with the advanced cyber met uh, sabermetrics to really judge defense. They're still trying to figure this out. Your range score basically is how much of the field can you cover. Like a Lorenzo Kane, who what was that? They said two thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by water, the other third is covered by Lorenzo Kane. Okay, I mean it's good, but let's not go crazy here. It's looking at what is you know how much ground can I cover versus how much ground can Michael cover. If I can cover more ground, either it means I'm faster or I read the ball better. Either way, I'm probably a better defender. Not that I can just get to the ball, but that I can get there and catch it. Okay. War wins against replacement. They're taking into account your range score, your batting average, your on base plus law. All those stats. If you're a pitcher, they're looking at all your stats. And they're saying, how much better are you than the person who would come into play for you? Okay. So if my war is plus five, means whoever would come in to replace me. We lose those five games versus if I were playing. Okay, <laughs> you know, and how do you figure that? Out? All right, but those are some of the stats that they're keeping up. With. What's WHIP? Walks. Walks plus hits per innings pitched. So if you've got a uh, pitcher who has a high WHIP but a low ERA, he or she lets a lot of people on base, but then they clamp down. And then allow the score. So, those are just some of the stats to be thinking about. And again, we keep adding more and more because baseball is a game of stats. A bunch of stat nerds who like to, to dig into it. They made a movie out of it, Moneyball, when they really started coming up with the safer metrics. Okay. So, if you're going to cover. <laughs> If you 
really like baseball. That's all. I wasn't a big fan when I was a kid growing up, and now I look back on it, it's one of my great regrets. I played baseball one year, and you talk about stats. I can tell you what I did every at bat the year that I played. I got hit in the butt with the first pitch I ever took. Right, bam, right there. Every time? Huh? Every time? No, just the first pitch I took. I ground into, I got a ground out to short. I walked once. I hit a triple. I tried to stretch into a home run. I got thrown out the plate. I hit a triple. And beyond that, I struck out every time. Usually looking. Usually going. When the ball was right across another foot. But I could feel the ball. That was a good first pitch. Again, as with anything, you're going to have to learn the basics. You have to learn the language. If you've never covered baseball, I would advise you this website is very good about teaching you some of the terms about, about baseball, about softball, about some of the differences, okay? Note that your positions are by, based by numbers. One is the pitcher, two is the catcher, three is first base, four is second base, five is third base, six is shortstop, seven is left field, eight is center field, Nine is right field. People always ask, well, why does it go from four, five, six when you're going from second base to third base to the shortstop? Shortstop is kind of a rover who is supposed to be able to move around, unlike today where you get somebody who pulls the ball all the time and they shift everybody over, which I hate. Um, that roving position to go out of the outfield and rove around. All right. Why do we use those numbers? keeping score. You'll see here in a minute how hard it would be if you were going to do it by their position as opposed to the number. All right. Uh, your plays are recorded as abbreviations like a 1B is a single, 2B is a double, that sort of thing. DB is a walk. Um, in pitch counts, the ball is always first. So a 1-0 count means you have one ball, no strikes. Note that it is a 1-0 count where the count is 1-0. There's a difference in the way those two are set. Uh, batters don't have to, re to get a hit to reach base. What are the ways that a batter can get on base? Walk, hit by pitch, hit, strike them out, uh, strike strike them out drop a third strike, and they get to first before the catcher can throw them out. Air. Air. Catcher's interference. If I'm swinging and I hit the, and the catcher gets his glove up there and I hit the glove and hit the ball and I get thrown out first, they're going to call catcher's interference and I get first base. some differences in the terms for baseball and softball. Okay, not a lot, but there are some, so keep those things in mind. Do bring a scorebook whenever you're doing a game. Learn to handle the board. That's the last slide we have here. I'm going to show you a little bit about how to keep score. Bring your own scorebook, though, especially if you're broadcasting the game live. Next week, we're going to talk about making a flip card. Baseball and softball, yeah, bring some notes, but keep a scorebook yourself because as you go through the game, you don't want to refer all the time to what they've done that season. You want to start talking about what they did their last at bat, okay? Or what the pitcher's done earlier in the game, what they did the previous inning, all right? So keep those things in mind. Do keep a notebook with you so you can take note of some things during the game. Um, significant plays that maybe happened in the third or fourth inning that stopped a rally, and then your team was able to continue on and they won the game. Record all the details. So you're keeping your scorebook. You want to record details, like how many runners were left on base. Did they turn a double play? How many double plays did they turn? Those are critical of getting pitchers out of messes. All right? Keep those types of things. Another good detail to keep is first pitch strikes. Why would that be important? Pitcher is better batting or better better average getting the batter out ahead of the time. Yeah, you've got a better chance of getting that batter out if you start off with a strike. If you start off with a ball, then the batter is instantly in control. 
because you want that next one to be a strike. Well, the batter then knows, okay, the ball's going to be around the strike, so I've got a better chance of hitting this. Okay? Keep the first, uh, pitch count. How many pitches they've thrown? The more pitches they throw early, the less likely they are to go deep into the game. How do they bat, or how did the batters do the second time through the order? Did their average go up the second time they saw the bat, the pitcher? Um, do you know how the team scored each inning? What, what, did they just keep moving the ball around? Were they, did they score four runs with two outs? Were they able to score runners from running uh, from score from scoring position? All right, we'll keep track of those. Look at ground ball versus fly ball outs. Those are some of the details to keep track of. Look for many streets. How many runners in a row got on base? Or how many uh, first uh, leadoff batters each inning got on? So if you go seven innings and the leadoff batter gets on for seven innings in a row, that pitcher's pitching out of a lot of stress. You know, and a lot of pitchers, they throw better from the windup where they bring the ball high and they come through versus the stretch where they can just stand here and they slide step or whatever because they, they want to watch the runner. That puts them under a lot of stress. It changes the way they can pitch, those types of things. Ask players after the game, ask players to talk about specific at bats. What were they looking for? Maybe the first two times they struck out and the third time they hit a grand slam. Well, what were they looking at? What did they see differently? Were they, was it a different pitcher? Did they make an adjustment? Those are the kinds of things we're, we're after. Ask their coaches or managers to explain their strategies. Why did you run a hit and run here? Why were you stealing so many bases early when that's not your MO? What, what were you seeing? Was it their pitcher that was slow to the plate? Does their catcher have a weak arm? What did you have going on? Ask the catchers to talk about the pitchers. So you know, Matt may be pitching in the game. I can talk to him about what was working, what wasn't. But his catcher is really going to be able to give me a lot of detail. Because the catcher is generally going to be the one calling the game, saying which pitches to throw in which situations. He or she's going to be the one watching the pitcher. And, you know, in softball, that catcher may realize the pitcher was getting off to one side of the rubber or the other, and therefore making that little adjustment worked. Okay. As with anything, don't follow a template. Don't start with, I'm going to give my lead, then I'm going to give a quote, then I'm going to give their scoring, then I'm going to give my stats, and then I'm done. Mix it up a little. Yes, you want to have a lead, and then you want to tell the story in chronological order as they score, but you can have some variety in that as well. Um, if you're doing a preview, find an angle about the two teams that are playing. For example, if I were covering the Royals and the, um, who did they just hit? No, not the White Sox. Who did Jordano Ventura just hit? Oh, the Royals. The Royals. The next time they play, I may want to refer back to that. Okay, what happened? What's the angle here? As these two teams are trying to advance. RBI stands for what? Runs batted in. So when you're broadcasting, it's not RBIs. Because that's runs batted in. It's just RBI. I hate that when they say RBIs. But go ahead and use it on first reference because everybody who calls baseball knows. Learn the differences between baseball and softball. Strategy, very much the same. Softball games, when I was in college, 1-0 games, 2-1 games were very, very common because it was really hard to score. So what would happen is your leadoff batter might get on with a walk. She'd steal second. She'd get sacrificed for third. They'd hit a sack fly driver home. It was that hard to score. Third baseman, our, our head coach, Susan Anderson, my first softball game here, I came to a game, she was standing halfway between the plate and third base. And I asked our assistant sports information director who was in charge of statting that game, I said, is she crazy? He said, that's where they play. I said, she's gonna get killed. First hit, right at her, she dropped her glove down, pinned it against her leg, took it a ball, rifled it first, got her out. Incredible but they played that close because so many batters try and slap bunt or just lay down a bunt, and so they'll play very close at third base. Okay. 
So look at some of the different things that they'll do in softballs. They'll let these slappers, they'll stand on the left hand batter's box and they're trying to run as they're slapping the ball. You have to watch, do they come out of the box? Because if they're all the way out of the box and they make contact, they're out. Okay, so watch for those things. Note the base pass, the size of the field is much, much different. There's also no pitcher's mound in softball, it's a circle. You still, I, I've never seen this before. In all the years I've been covering sports, I had never seen it until this past season. I mean, Matthew and I were calling a game together. They called our pitcher for an illegal pitch. And I don't, did she, she came set before she went to pitch, and then she brought him apart, she came set again, and there was a runner on. I called it for a ball. I've never seen it in softball. I see it all the time in baseball. So you have to watch uh, what the differences are between those two. Okay. All right. Now I need to make a little adjustment. I want to zoom that camera in. So we're going to talk about keeping score and soft. No, the board got it all laid out for you. Thank you. Okay. So this is a typical scorecard. Whenever I go to a ball game, I have to get a scorecard. I have to keep score. My wife just shakes her head and laughs at me, but it keeps me focused on the game. So, you got your lineup. Who you're starting nine? We're going to play National League. The, bat, the pitcher's going to bat. Number on the left side. Position number on the right. Okay. First pitch is a strike. Second pitch. A strike. You got a ball, a ball, and then Grant Moore places a single to left field. So I've got him on first base. I show where the ball went, and he got on on the single. Okay. Now what you can do is block in what the first pitch was. Again, I told you you might want to keep track of what they threw on the first pitch. So make that note a little bit different, so then you can go through and count what their first pitch is. Hmm? L-line? I call that a line out the right field. You do come up, there's no set way of doing this. Let me, let me, thank you. Come back and say, there is no set way of keeping a scorebook. This is the way I learned to do it. This is the way it makes sense to me. You do need to find what works for you. Okay, because there's a difference, like with what Matthew's saying, L line in my book, a line drive to the right fielder is just straight at him. He makes a grab versus a fly ball that is arching to the right fielder. Okay, which I would call an F line. So there, you have to have some way of differentiating. Um, Johnson then comes up, and on the first pitch, he's out. Sack hit, four, three. Runner advances because of the second batter, but he's out. Sack hit, 4-3, okay? 4-3 means sac he sac tried to sacrifice bunt, second baseman fielded it, threw to first base, and he's out. That's your 4-3, okay? Dylan comes up, takes a, walk, or takes a ball, gets a strike, gets a strike, and we're going to say he wasn't paying attention. Backwards K, strikeout looking. So he never swung the bat. All right, so now I have two outs. Bear comes up. He's been paying attention. He's my cleanup hitter. He's the one that should be driving in a lot of runs. Home run. That run scores. This run scores. Put two dots in there saying he had two RBI. Okay. Swanson comes up and on the first pitch he sees F7, fly ball to center field, or fly ball to left field, and he's the third out. Now we come down here at the bottom, and that inning has scored two runs on two hits. There were no errors, and nobody left on base. Okay. I know O'Connor comes up. Is that next one O'Connor? Mm -hmm. O'Connor. O'Connor. Um, yes, he has one pitch of bat. How do you show that? How do you show that? Yeah. 
that's where you're going to start taking <laughs> notes. And that may be, if there's really no place on a scorebook to do that sort of thing, that's a great question. Because again, you want to see how many pitches they throw. You may want to keep a tally mark next to your pitcher. That's what I think. Yeah. Nice to fill out with my dad. Mm -hmm. I got never, I just strikes and balls. I yeah. Count the pitch. yeah. But if you can keep those tally marks, thank you. Because yeah, this all this is going to show you is, like for example, well, he threw a pitch here, but he swung at the first pitch and knocked it out of the park, okay, because there's no count. This one, he, he threw a ball, two strikes, and then strike three, so he threw four pitches in that at bat. That's like one of the mini stats to keep track of the guy, pitch up guy. Yep. Where am I pitching? Yeah. If you want to see your leadoff guys doing that, your leadoff guy, that's one thing I can't stand about on CSS clocks. Swings at the first pitch every time. Run up the count. That's your job as a, as a leadoff hitter. Let the other batters behind you see what kind of pitches this guy throws and run up his count. And then do it. Okay? Second game, or second inning rolls around. And let's see, O'Connell, walk or a strike, ball, ball, and then he gets on on an E6. E6 throwing. Okay? So the shortstop fielded it cleanly, maybe throw to first base, over through first base. If it's just a, if you just put, if it's just a field error, just put E6. Put the T to make sure that it's clear that he's throwing. Okay. Now Vecchio comes up and walk the ball. Strike, strike, and so on a 3-0 count, typically batters are not going to be swinging because we're gonna take the chance that we're still ahead of the count, they're going to walk us. Especially if you're the number seven batter, you're down at the bottom of the order. Well, now Vecchio missed the sign and he swung away and he ground into double play. T, six, four, three. So he's out number one. He's out number two. Actually, he'd be number one. And then the ring grounded into a out of first base, three unassisted. Ground ball to first base, fielded it, touched the bag, out. Okay. Now, good old Lord greased lightning, but he pulled a hamstring. Dang it, game's over. He's out of the game. So number five, Smith is going to have to come in and play second base. I tell you what, we're multi-dimensional. He's going to come to shortstop. He's going to go to second base. You draw this line to say, Moore's day is done. This is when Smith came into the game. Okay. Questions? If there's a pitching change, Stats in baseball and softball is fun. It's a lot. It's a lot easier than any other sport because it's just on a blip on a book there that, that you know you can write it up as you're going along and say my next time or the next time up for this guy. If I'm broadcasting, I'm going to say uh, last time up Johnson laid down a perfect bunt, sacrifice, uh, sacrifice four three, moved more into scoring position. Perfect execution. Something like that. Okay. But again, find a method that works for you. Because this doesn't work for whatever it does. And like on that over each end you put who's a left here and switch one else. You don't have to. Okay. Might help you. That's one more thing for me to be looking at. I can tell when they come up to bat with the batting. If they're now the switch hitter coming up would be, you know, I can notice, okay, well, you got a left handed batter. That part, that should be part of your pre game prep. You should know just when you see him come up that they're a switch hitter or a left hand. Okay. Questions? All right. Let's talk a little sports talk.
sports talk. Nobody? sense that it can you know radio can kind of be background noise for whatever it is you're doing but the only time I really get to listen to the radio is in my commute to work and it takes me four minutes to get to work so they just get into a topic and I'm here or I could listen to it in my office but in my office I'm usually trying to write or grade or do something like that and I'm not even paying attention to what they're doing anyway I'll try and listen to podcasts of uh, sports talk whenever I'm running but I don't do that as much as I should so Sports talk is a growing area. See here, Tom Taylor once said, we've gone from a time when the industry openly ridiculed the idea of a full-time sports station to an environment where some markets have three or even all, or four all sports radio outlets. We have how many in Kansas City? Four. And that doesn't include when we were at 610. Is that including that one? Yeah. See, one number, so. Okay, 610 has another sports talk station that they don't really advertise very much because they're still trying to figure out how to make money off of it, but they don't want it competing with 610. So it's within Intercom, the overall arching television and radio stations they have, but they have their own, the second sports talk show, okay? You check this out, this article here. The number of sports talk radio stations in the United States has grown from a whopping 64% in the 10 years since 2002. 2002, 4 and 13 radio stations were sports talkers. By last year, that number had jumped to 677. 677. Let's uh, let that number sink in for a second. That averages out to around 13 sports talk radio stations per state. Well, think about how far stations reach. You are blanketing that state in sports talk radio. Yeah, there's a lot of periods. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of periods. Why? Why has it grown so much? I mean, you all are sports fans. You're taking a sports reporting class. You're sports communication minors, and only one of you really listens to it. So why has it grown so much? Because we have an insatiable appetite for sports. We want to know what is going on. We want to hear people talking about it. We want to hear the details. Even if we don't want to call in, we want to listen to the callers and berate them and make fun of them. Yeah. And it covers a wide range. When I was in Virginia at Norfolk State University doing my internship, there was a sports talk radio station there that I used to listen to. And the year that I left, the Mules were going to play Wisconsin Whitewater, I think it was, at Division Three school in football. Well, Wisconsin Whitewater, the game was scheduled for, I think it was a Thursday. The NCAA said Division three schools could not start until the next day. They could start their season until the next day. So our head coach came up with the idea, well, what if we played at midnight? They played that football game at midnight so that Division three technically was now starting on the Friday. They were talking about that in Virginia on Sports Talk Radio because it was such an interesting time. So you get a wide range, okay? But we have an insatiable ac appetite for sports so therefore, you're getting more and more of these stations, all right? It is primarily a radio format. Because what are you watching? I mean, even if you look at PTI or Mike and Mike or uh, Roman's Burning or you know, those types of shows that are sports talk shows, what are you watching? It's the, hmm? it's the, Two people sitting there talking. Now, the good ones are going to have some highlights thrown in, but by and large, they're just talking. They may have really colorful sets. How many of you watch, have ever watched PTI? Or not PTI? No. no. Yeah, it is PTI with Mike Wolbaum and um, uh, Tony Kornreiser. That's PTI, right? Yeah. yeah. They're all running together in my head. They have all the artifacts and the bobbleheads and the pennants and, the, and that stuff on their set, so it's really colorful. They do the graphics down the side, 
that show you what topics coming up next. They have the mailbox that they'll pop open and reach in and pull out uh, questions or tweets or things like that. So they try and make the set really colorful and creative. And their graphics are really creative, but you're really just watching two people sitting there. So it's much more of a radio format, okay? To be good at it, you have to be an expert on contemporary sports topics. This isn't a trivia show. We want to know what's going on, what's happening in the NHL, what's happening in uh, Major League Baseball, even though we're a third of the way into the season, pennant races are not even close to coming to fruition right now. Um, NFL is in their OTAs. You need to know what is happening in sports. What impact did Muhammad Ali have on the world? Not just boxing, but on the world. Gordy Howe. Anybody realize, you know, we all know who Gordy Howe is. Mr. Hockey scored a goal in his teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Scored at least one goal. Scored over 100 goals. I think it was 169, I think they said, after he was elected to the Hall of Fame. He retired, got elected to the Hall of Fame, and then came back and scored 169 goals, apparently. I don't really follow hockey. He kind of got lost in the shuffle because Muhammad Ali died. And he died a couple days later. He died the day of Muhammad Ali's funeral. So we've got to talk about him, though. We've got to bring that into the conversation, all right? You need to come into each show with a list of topics, things you're going to talk about. But be prepared to shift gears. Be flexible. Why is that important? Why would you need, ever need to be flexible and deviate from the topics at hand? You can have breaking news happen right away. You can have something happen right then and there. Okay, why else? What's one of the formats in sports talk? What do you hear happen a lot in sports talk? Somebody besides Matthew. Is that right? What did you say? Current events. Well, that's what we're talking about. Not so current events. Not current events, too. That, that'd be kind of like your breaking news. John said. Yeah, that's your breaking news. I'm talking about even with current events, that's still part of your list of topics you're going to address. Like 610, they don't break news. They just report it. So not they just report what other people mm -hmm. break news. What is one of the formats you can see in sports talk? Are you here in sports talk, in sports talk radio? What is one of the things that will happen during it? Okay, so you're there having their debate, they're having their discussion. Like Collins. Collins. You may have somebody call and say, you guys have been talking an awful lot about the Royals. Can we talk about Sporting KC? Yeah, sure, we didn't have that as a topic today. What do you want to talk about? You have to be prepared for somebody to call in and maybe change your line of thinking. Can I just say, yeah, what do you want to talk about? And you ask your question or you talk about it. I go, okay, great, thanks, Allison, bye. Anyway, back to the Royals. Okay. I need to know something going on with Sporting KC so that I can continue this conversation, right? So you need to be able to be flexible and deviate. Some shows don't take phone calls. Huh? Some shows don't take phone calls. Some don't, and so then you don't have to worry about that situation, but you do have to be considerate of maybe something broke. Maybe what we talked about with the guys at 610 is they'll meet after the show, they'll debrief about what they could do better, They'll get together the next morning and talk about topics to address for the next show, and then they'll say, okay, well, let's go away, let's go our separate ways for 15, 20 minutes. Within that 15, 20 minutes, something could have happened. All right? You need to be prepared to talk about it. That's not like the meeting. Hmm? That's not like the meeting. Same thing with like the call in. You may have to do the live tweet instead. Be polite and respectful for those call ins. You may get some butthead call in that just goes on a rant that has nothing to do with anything, okay? If you're rude, maybe you don't care if that person ever calls in again, but you have other listeners who are gonna be like, oh, at some point I might wanna have a different opinion or whatever, and they're rude to him. I don't wanna get called out and be treated like that, so they're not gonna call back. The only time it's okay to hit that drop button is when? When they cuss. When they cuss. There's about a 15 second delay. Or they can. Right. If they don't like it, they, they you know, but you still say, okay, thanks for your opinion, drop. You know, you're still being polite about it, okay? And then be creative. You're going to have to come up with something different. Some of the formats, I'll get back to that other point here in a minute. Some of the formats you might look at, you're going to begin with a monologue. This is going to be your assignment coming up with this. 
a monologue where you're talking about just the day in sports or what you're going to be addressing and give a preview for that day. Then you might have a call, and then you get into, okay, now we're going to take a break, you come back, and then you get into what you talked about in the preview. You might do a call-in show where you're here to talk and you're going to do your monologue and then you go straight into a call-in. You could have a two or three person debate. When we were six ten when they really got heated into their debate, my son Grant, some of y'all got to meet him. Uh, he went with us to the, the Arrowhead the other day and he went with us to six ten. They did that debate and he came out just, wow. He felt that was pretty cool. Or you could just do a Q&A. And a Q&A would simply be, you know, Allison's a great softball player. I want to bring her in because she's getting ready to go to the Olympics. She's not because the Olympics are her softball playing the Olympics. But she's going to go compete, say she's going to go compete in the Olympics because they're bringing it back in 2016. So I want to bring her in and just do a QA, and a do an interview with her. Okay. But those are some of the different formats you can be looking at. The big question is what are you going to do different? What is going to make your show different than any other? Mike and Mike, PTI, Around the Horn, Roman's Burning, they all have a similar format, but they each have their niche, their angle, their thing that, do, that they do that makes them different. What are you going to do different? Okay. One of the things um, that John Hansen was talking about was they don't just talk sports. They talk about what sports fans are talking about. So what's a big topic in the news right now? Florida, what happened in Orlando? Let's talk about that. Sports fans are talking about it. And he made the point that we get calls from people saying, just talk sports. Okay, thank you very much. Well, primarily, we're, primarily we're talking sports, but we are gonna talk about the news too. We're gonna cover some of these things. So it's okay to talk about news. One of the, the texts that I was looking at whenever I was preparing today's lesson was talking about, they have a sports talk show and there was a blackout in their city. They were still on the air. The radio stations were still on the air, but the, all the lights and the power stuff, I guess they were on a different grid, I don't know. They were talking people through what was going on. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna make your show different? Are you gonna do live tweets? Are you gonna go on location for your shows? Are you gonna do call-in? Are you just gonna go straight debate? Are you gonna mix it up? What are you gonna do, okay? There are talk shows, sports talk shows, in smaller communities. I used to do one here in town with Coco until I had to get a professor who got pregnant in the middle of the semester and had to leave because she got put on bed rest, so I had to pick up her class. I had to leave doing the show, and I've never got to go back to it. Um, but we just talked about UCM athletics and talked about the MIAA. I'd love to see him do a high school sports show because we got a lot of high schools that listen to our local radio. But you can start out at a smaller station and do your own sports talk show there. It's just about the local sports. Okay. What Bob Moore was saying was that these guys don't have a great shelf life unless you know, you're famous. They spend some time in a community and then they move on unless they become big and become syndicated. Why would they have to move on? Well, they either get fired for going too far or they burn a lot of bridges and they can't get inside information anymore. So then they have to go to some other community to build their brand there. So. It's a fun way to get involved in broadcasting, fun way to get involved in sport reporting in general. The key thing, as with everything else we've talked about, is what do you have to get? What do you have to do? You guys are going to have to perk it up and talk more. You're going to be in it. Oh, that was a question. Yeah, that was a question. <laughs> what do you really have to do? <laughs> No. <laughs> what are you going to have to do? Morgan, what are you going to have to do to be successful in this? Whatever stands out to the listeners. You have to do what stands out to listeners. Devote a lot of time. You have to devote a lot of time. You have to start small. You have to start small. You're going to have to prep. You're going to have to do your research. You're going to have to know what are the topics that people are interested in, and you're going to have to know them front and back. So you're going to have to read everything you get your hands on. You're going to have to develop credibility so you can get some inside sources. You're going to have to be there. You're going to have to go to the practices and go to the games so you get to know the players, you get to know the coaches. They, you build some trust so that they know that, you know, if we screw up, they're going to call us on it. But they're also going to talk about us in a positive manner too. So. 
Okay? All right. Your assignment is to develop your own sports talk show. And this I do want recorded. Okay? Your objective is to prepare to do the monologue portion of a sports talk show, which often starts that type of program and sets the stage for at least some of the later elements. The segment will be an ad lib of at least five minutes and not more than seven. So five to seven minutes. At the end of the ad lib, you will announce that it's time to take your first telephone call. You don't have to take the first telephone call. That just lets me know you've done your first part. All right? Can either be done for radio or television. I really don't care how you set it up. I want you to use your local and national newspapers, sports magazines like Sports Illustrated, ESPN, the magazine, what have you, and other sources to identify several timely and appropriate topics. I want you to research these topics so you're prepared to talk about them at some length. Five topics would be the max for the segment, but four would be better, uh, be better in demonstrating some depth. Okay. Gather appropriate stats and anecdotes. Uh, to enliven your presentation, prepare your notes, plan how you'll start, sequence of the topics and the order of points and ideas you'll present. So you're kind of laying out your outline so you can talk about this once you get into the show. And as it's presumed to be live, you will have only one take, but off mic you can practice your open or any other parts you wish. Okay. So your open is just the monologue. You can script that out, but I don't want it to sound like you're reading your script. So practice it. Go through it. It may be easier for some of you to just make bullet points so you can ad lib it. If you go back and look at some of the last, last semester's episodes of Campus Chatter, go to our YouTube channel. Okay, if you look at a couple of those, we videotaped it. You can see that Jermaine and Ricky were reading their intro and they sounded like they were reading their intro most of the time. And I got on them about that. I don't want it read. Ad lib it. Give it some life. Give it some energy. Okay? Just give an overview, you can talk about one specific topic and give us an overview of today's show. Like with Jim Rohn, for instance, here's what I'm burning on, and he'll talk about what he's burning on, okay? Determine how you'll end each segment and how you'll conclude when it's time to take phone calls. So basically what I'm looking for here is an outline, all right? So you got your monologue, we're gonna take our first call, then you're gonna have a block of, these are my next topics, break, these are the next topics for our address, break, something like that, okay? I want that part, you don't have to record all of them. You just record the monologue, because I want to hear the monologue and I want to see your notes to see that you've done your prep work, what topics you're going to be addressing. Does that make sense? Yes, no. So the monologue is five to seven minutes. But the and monologue then, is five to seven minutes. Okay, and then you don't, you don't actually talk about Right. Yeah, your monologue is just, you're going to introduce the show. Um, today we're going to be talking about X, Y, Z, and A. But here's what I'm really thinking about today. Here's what's on my mind today. And then you talk, we address one particular topic. Okay. okay. But then the, today we're at the X, Y, Z, and A is what's going to be each of your segments. So segment one may be X and Y, and then you take a break, and section, uh, segment uh, two will be C, take a break, and then the last one is A, okay, does that make sense? That's all just outlined, okay. all right? The only part you record is your monologue. If you're on campus, you can use our radio labs, but you're going to need to get with me and schedule a time, and I will tell you that it is summertime, I am bouncing all over the place, so get with me early to get this figured out. You don't have to get with me. You can just go on your computer. Um, Audacity or Audition, I can't remember which one we teach. What do we use in our audio production class? Audacity. Audacity. It's a free download. So you can download that and just record into it. I'm not looking for audio quality. You don't have to have an external microphone. You can just record it into the mic on your computer. I'm perfectly fine with that. I just want to hear it. I want to hear your energy. I want to hear your presentation. Okay. Plus the fact that it's a little more fun than just writing things. Actually try and record it. See if you can put some personality. See if you've got some sound, uh, some sound effects that you'd like to use, or some music, something, something you want to do. It's your chance to be creative. Okay. Um, you can record it just on your cell phone if you need to, and then just download and send me the file, whether that's a WAV file or uh, some other file. Okay. 
okay? Again, I'm not going to be grading on the quality of your audio. I'm going to be grading on the quality of your voice. If you just read it in a monotone and I can tell that you're reading it, there's not a whole lot of energy to it, that tells me you didn't take it seriously, you really didn't care about it, you'll be graded accordingly. If you've got some energy, if you do ad lib it, you do show that you're just trying to talk about it and you're trying to have some life to it, that'll be in your favor, okay? Submit your script and your notes through email. Just email those to me with the WAV file or whatever file it is that you save it in, all right? This is due Sunday, June 26th by midnight. That's the last Sunday of the semester. I'm giving you a little extra time on that, okay? Questions? I would advise you before you start doing this, listen to or watch a couple of sports talk shows so you can see what they do for their intro, for their monologue. Some of them are only a couple of minutes. Some of them are up to 10 to 12 minutes. I want five to seven. Capiche? All right. Last thing, Thursday, we are going to Time Warner Cable Sports up in Kansas City. Um, used to be Metro Sports. They used to be the group that would broadcast, they were the first group that used to broadcast the MIAA football and basketball game of the week. Um, they don't do that anymore. That's not a media group now. Nick Jacobs is one of our graduates. He has watched with interest what we've done with our program and how we've expanded it. Uh, gave me a lot of feedback and critique last year on Sports Page. He's going to visit with us. We will get to sit in on their um, production meeting that day. Who all is interested in going? I'll get back to you if I can go or not. I think we're supposed to be there at 10. Yeah, we're supposed to be there at 10 this week. This week. Do what? Yeah. Chris, Michael, you're going to go. Alex, you're going to go. Morgan, you want to go? Yeah, I'm out of town. You're out of town? Okay. Right here. Okay. All right. I will check with the others. Um, let see about that. Okay? Okay.